it's about starting where we are and uh and not looking at you know so ex- like i can't do what he's doing instead the question should be what can i do Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 38 with Rob Greenfield. And Rob is not a conventional kind of guy. He's currently living in a tiny house built with 99% repurposed materials that he built for under $1,500. And his current project is called Food Freedom. He's growing and foraging 100% of his food for an entire year. Before you hit skip, it might be easy to say, this is too extreme for me, I'm never going to do anything like this. But Rob is truly an example of somebody who's living intentionally and designing experiments for his life to show us all how we can live a little bit better. So even if you don't plan on living off-grid or foraging for all your own food. This is a really unique and interesting interview, and I think Rob's mindset and his enthusiasm and positivity is much needed and will inspire you on whatever tiny house journey you are planning to embark on. If you're serious about planning and building a tiny house in 2019, then I want to let you know about something that might be of interest. I have an online community called Tiny House Engage. And Tiny House Engage is a place online where you can get your tiny house questions answered every single day by me and by a whole community of other people who are on their own tiny house journeys. Building a tiny house can be confusing, it can be frustrating, And being able to have your questions answered on a regular basis is one of the most important factors in getting through the process without going completely crazy. I only open registration for Tiny House Engage every four to six weeks. And as of today, Friday, December 21st, registration is open. You can learn more at thetinyhouse.net slash T-H-E. I'll tell you more about Tiny House Engage after the show, but to learn more and register now, head over to thetinyhouse.net slash T-H-E. All right, I am here with Rob Greenfield. Rob is an adventurer, environmental activist, humanitarian, and a dude making a difference. He is dedicated to leading the way to a more sustainable and just world. Rob is currently living in a 100 square foot tiny house made of 99% repurposed materials in urban Orlando, Florida. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ethan. Good to be on with you. Glad to have you. So this is not your first tiny house. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about yourself and your genesis of how you came to tiny house living and how that kind of evolved through multiple iterations. Sure. Yeah, my first tiny house was in 2015. I had been thinking about it for a couple of years at that time. Um, just I'd just been working on simplifying my life, living with less money, living in a more, I, I want to say sustainable, but ultimately less destructive way. Um, and all of those things, you know, were all reasons that I wanted to just um, – shrink drastically the size of my possessions and my living abode. And in 2015, I had just gotten back from my second bike ride across the country. So I had had plenty of experiences of, um, you know, traveling tiny uh, on my bike with my tent. And uh, the next step was where I lived to have a tiny house. And uh, I was going to build my own. I went on to Craigslist to, to actually look for a camper that I could uh, sleep in for the couple of months while I built it. And then I found this little 50 square foot tiny house. It said it was $950 and uh, on a trailer. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting, pretty cool looking. So I went and checked it out. Next thing I knew it, I was giving them 950 bucks and I had myself a, the tiniest tiny house that most people have ever seen. It was 50 square feet? Yeah. So 
five feet wide, so not quite wide enough for me to stretch my arms, and 10 feet long. So it was, you know, basically a box for my bed and my little bit of possessions that I had. I had so few possessions. And, um, you know, the idea was that I wanted to, I wanted to, I had lived in a three bedroom apartment before that. And actually I had downsized my life to, I was sleeping in the six by six closet, which is 36 square feet and renting out the rooms plus giving my sister a free place to live when, as I moved her out to San Diego. And, um, so I had already had some experience with that, you know, with tiny living. Um, so it was small and only less than six feet tall. Like I couldn't stand in it. Um, but it was really just a place to be comfortable and to not get stuck in because it's the more stuff you have and the bigger space you have, the easier it is to get stuck and rather to spend as much of my time outside in my community, uh, in nature, uh, you know, just outside of the home. That was really what it was. So I'll share an experience that, um, what immediately preceded my tiny house was going on a 2000 mile bicycle tour, self-supported and ended up doing a lot of couch surfing and stayed in several tiny houses. And I've actually, I know some other people who also came to tiny houses after getting really into bicycle touring or vice versa. And I'm curious if you, do you see a connection between bicycle travel and tiny house living for you? I, n- I never made an exact direct connection. Um, I mean, they're connected in the sense that like a bicycle is tiny compared to a car. Uh, you know, just one of the elements of that, for example, when I did get rid of my car in 2012, you know, I didn't expect some things. But one thing that I realized is when I got rid of my car, I also got rid of the trunk, which meant there was no space for when I went to the store to buy huge amounts of stuff that I turns out I didn't need. And so, you know, there's all these things when you make these changes that you don't realize the positive repercussions that will happen um, because you've never done it before. And so, yeah, I mean, they're definitely highly correlated because a lot of, you know, for tiny houses, it's about simplicity. Bicycling is simplicity. It's about spending less money oftentimes and financial freedom and cycling. You know, the average American spends $7,000 a year on their car, whereas a bike costs, you know, very, very little to maintain. Um, And, uh, you know, getting away from uh, fossil fuels, living a more sustainable lifestyle. So they're all, you know, for me, they're deep. Yeah, definitely deeply connected. There's no, no way about that. But which came first, which was the chicken and which was the egg? I don't really know. Well, that's okay. They can, they can both occur together for, yeah, for you. And they, they do for me too. So how would you describe your, your current lifestyle? Cause, and maybe you could talk about what about the 50 foot square foot tiny house, you know, what worked and what didn't work about it and what made you want to upgrade? Yeah, well, it worked for what I wanted it. And that was, I was just planning on living there for a year or two. Um, partly because I was only planning on staying in San Diego for another year or two. And I ended up living in San Diego for another year. And that's when I uh, got rid of that tiny house. I auctioned it off to raise funds to build houses for people in San Diego without homes, which is still a, a work in progress. We're built uh, there. You know, my friends that I part, that I donated the money to are working on building the first tiny house community there for homeless people. Um, But uh, so it worked exactly what I wanted for the time. Now, 50 square feet, too small forever, for sure. Um, And that's why my new tiny house is 100 square feet, twice the size. But it's actually four times the size when you look at volume, because it's also it's also lofty. It's got, you know, good eight foot ceilings. So it's probably yeah four times the total size as the as the 50 square footer. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is that I was living extremely simple. So the average American has something like 20 or 30,000 possessions, just a unfathomable number of possessions. I had whittled my, whittled my life down to 600 possessions. And that includes every card in the wallet, you know, every cord, every, uh, you know, everything that 
that 600, every pair of underwear, you name it. Um, so I was living extremely simply. Now I'm doing a project where I'm growing and foraging 100% of my food. And when you're that, when you're working that much with the land, that you know typically requires tools, a lot of storage space for food. And so it's all about adapting your, it's, it's, you know, it's about designing your living situation around your lifestyle. And that's what I do. I, I look at my life, my climate, uh, you know, my goals for the years to come. And that's how I design the living situation that I have. So you do it very intentionally rather than just doing what the people around you are doing or what you think think of or what society tells you is quote unquote normal it's definitely very intentional i mean for example on you know i've only put out one video about my tiny house so far because it's still a bit of a work in progress but a lot of comments say it's just a shed and my response is thank you i designed it to look like a shed so it'll fit into this neighborhood and not be noticed actually um because sheds are everywhere backyard sheds these these kind of wooden sheds and i uh and you know my tiny house is not uh technically legal as in most cities it's not technically legal uh, fully up to code um so i was you know that was a great compliment whereas some people would see that as like this big burn like ah oh, this guy lives in a shed i'm like wow if i designed my house i tricked you just like i wanted <laughs> That's awesome. And of course, there's there's not that much different between a shed and a house. They're both shelter. I mean, I suppose there's some aesthetic differences and how they're finished, but there are plenty of people who take shed kits and then convert them into fully insulated tiny houses. So so no no problem there from my camp. That was what I was going to do, make the shed kit, but that's where it came in that I just, I really wouldn't, I wanted to make it out of repurposed materials and the shed kit thing. I just couldn't, I couldn't line up all the materials to match up a kit. So I had to go straight up, like, you know, back to square one and just design it, uh, you know, with the, with the similar design to a shed, but on my own way, depending on what resources that I could find that were secondhand. I really want to talk about the, the repurposed materials, but before we get off the topic of your, kind of your parking situation. I was curious if you could talk about like what is your arrangement with, you know, who owns the house? Do you, how much do you pay to be there? It sounds like you're under the radar. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, that's kind of, you know, I don't know. I'm not super in the whole tiny house circle, but I know outside of that circle on my page, those are the most common questions. And I'm assuming the tiny house circle is, you know, people listening to podcasts are largely people who don't live in tiny house who want to. And it's probably that exact same question. Like, how do, how the heck do you, does it work? Uh, some of those, like, how do you make it actually happen? Confirmed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. So basically the situation is this, um, what I did here in Orlando and also what I did in San Diego is that I wanted to do a work exchange. So I have largely demonetized my life altogether. Um, my net worth is right now I have a thousand dollars to my name, probably a little less than that. Um, and uh, all of my possessions, including the tiny house, are valued at less than five thousand dollars. So, you know, my goal is is to generate actually minimal money and and live based on relationships and the resources that are freely available from that you know from the earth. Uh, and be connected to that, connected to people, connected to earth. So what I did uh, is I just, um, I put out a blog that said looking for a home for my tiny home. And what I explained was that I was looking for someone with an unused backyard because there's millions of unused backyards all across the nation um, that, you know, wanted to improve their land, um, you know, wanted to grow food, uh to you know live a more sustainable life have composting rainwater harvesting all of these things and that in exchange for me building my tiny house in their backyard and uh, for a period of two years i would do all that i would you know i would grow food i would help them learn how to grow their own food and the idea is that the relationship wouldn't be just a two-year thing it's that when i leave 
they will have all these skills that they didn't have before and all the infrastructure that I build will be left behind. So I've I found a, a woman named Lisa here and she's in her early 60s, I think 62. So it's a great relationship because she's at an age where it's hard to lift heavy things and it's been her dream to homestead for honestly, I think she said about 25 years or 30 years. It's been her dream. So um, we're helping match, you know, match each other's needs. Um, and uh, so we just do a work exchange, no, no, uh, no financial exchange at all. Um, and uh, also the tiny house will be hers after I leave. So she'll use this hopefully as a place to host people. She's an herbalist and I'm hoping she'll host other uh, herbalists and uh, they can work in the garden and such and, you know, continue this nice added value to her property. But worst case scenario, it just turns into a nice, a very nice shed. Um, and as far as permits go, I, I decided to go the route of just designing it like a shed. So it's in code in that way. Uh, I didn't put it on wheels because a trailer is two, three thousand dollars usually, and I don't, I don't want to ever move it. Um, so that would have doubled the cost of the house for something that would never really be used. So instead, I designed it this way, and um, it's not, I'm not technically allowed to live in a shed, um, but the structure itself is is technically legal. Um, and I don't live quite, you know, people know, a lot of people know where I live. I'll have the news over for sure, the local news, and I have, you know, different media coming here. So I'm not like, I definitely don't live in hiding or anything like that. Um, but I don't, uh, I didn't call up the city and say, hey, here's where I live either. Sounds like the neighbors immediately around Lisa must know that you're there and they must be okay with it. I actually don't know if they know that I'm here or not. Um, I it's a nice. I the other thing is when I you know when I was looking for a place, I was looking for a place that was enclosed and you know very private. So there's a fence all the way around it, um, and I assume the neighbors know that I'm I'm here. But I actually haven't. It's kind of an interesting thing because normally I would actually like to meet the neighbors, um, but in this scenario, there's a little bit of me who has actually just been sort of like keeping to myself it's it's an interesting it, it you know it, it's honestly an interesting thing for me because I live a very open public life but at the same time there's this slight element of feeling like I'm a little bit tucked into this corner uh on the street and I don't know if people know that I live here or not to be honest talking about the repurposed materials I really loved the video that you made because I think you did a great job of explaining just the the timeline and the extra work and you know what it takes to build with repurposed materials. And I think that people look at tiny houses made from repurposed materials and they only see the end goal. They only see the end result and they only see the price tag. And they're like, oh, I've, I'm going to do that. But they don't really look at how much extra work went into it. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how long you sourced materials for the house before you actually could start building. Yeah, it is an incredible amount of work to build from repurposed materials. And, you know, so many times I went back and forth between, okay, just make a materials list, go to the hardware store, buy it all in a period of one day, bring it all back at once, have it all lined up correctly, and then just build the tiny house in a short period of time with a group of people versus find each material in all these different places and have to have them either delivered or pick them up and uh, do the research on whether that exact thing is the right type of wood or the right type of hardware. And uh, I mean, so much work went into that. Um, I could have saved a hundred hours, maybe like, you know, two and a half weeks of what would be considered a full-time job. Um, maybe more. I don't know if I had just gone with the straight up, you know, buying everything new. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a lot, it was a huge amount of work because then, you know, you have to pull apart pallets, pull apart fence panels. Um, I worked with a lot of inconsistent materials, so it's harder to make things square because some things are warped. 
Um, and so it causes little frustrations and delays all the time working with repurposed materials. I am so glad that I did it because to be honest, if I had, if I had a house built of all new materials, I just wouldn't be proud of it. It just, it doesn't represent me and, and it just, it wouldn't be something that I'd be excited about. Whereas now, you know, I got through the hard times and now I'm really excited about this place. I'm so excited to be able to look at it and say, no, you know, I did not, I did not uh, contribute to deforestation or even, you know, what they call sustainable forestry, which sometimes is and sometimes isn't. Um, and just, you know, buying from these stores, like I didn't want to shop at any of the big box stores at all. And I managed not to. I really don't like going into those places. Um, and so, yeah, huge amount of work, but, you know, so absolutely worth it. Because of that, I'm really in love with this. I mean, in love. I mean, not like I would love, a, you know, a human, but pretty, I really like this place a lot because, because of the, you know, the, the, the repurposed materials aspect of it. Yeah. And everything just has a story. You can look around the house and, you know, when you've just bought the materials at a hardware store, that doesn't really, there's not much of a story there, but when you, you know, found the pallets for your foundation on the side of the bike path, that's something memorable. And every time you look at your house and the foundation, you're like, I remember that day that I saw those. Yeah, it's definitely, there's little stories like uh, the the drip edge, for example. My friend brought that over. It had been sitting in his garage for 15 years, left over from a project from when I was like, what, in high school, uh, that stuff was sitting around just crazy. And, and uh, I mean, what I do, I design things not for the sake of myself, really. I design things for the sake of the educational experience and the lessons they can impart on to others. And so that's what this, this tiny house really is. A, it's a demonstration site. It's a place to show uh, sustainable living, simple living, being more connected with our resources and in tune. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's why this also matters so much because it represents so much more than just some, it's, you know, it's not just a home for me. It really is my message. One of my messages to the, to the people out there. I'm sure that some people look at what you're doing and say, you know, that's too extreme for me. You know, I could never do that because I have kids or I have all this stuff or, you know, lots of excuses. But what do you hope that people can take away from what you're doing when especially when they're like they are on that 20,000 possession, you know, 2500 square foot house end of things? Yeah, I mean, so I'm very upfront with the fact that I do live a fairly extreme life in comparison to the average Western life. And I do that intentionally because here's the reality of the situation is that when you actually look at the American way of life, you know, America, the United States makes up 5% of the world's population, but uses 25% of the world's resources. That is by definition is extreme. We are the extreme country. We are the ones that are consuming resources to a degree that um, is, you know, not something that can be done forever and that only a small percentage of, of the world can do. So by definition, that really makes us extreme. So what I've designed my life to be is basically a counterbalance to that. Uh, and I've gone to the other ex end of the extreme to show what can be done. And the purpose is not to uh, you know, get people to go this far. The purpose is to get people to edge this way some from the, you know, the extreme but seemingly normal way of, uh, you know, of life that we have in the United States. And so it's really about starting where people are. Um, and just, you know, it's really about, it's about triggering uh, self-reflection and thinking about our lives and how we impact the world and what we can do in our own communities and our, at our schools, at our work, uh, with our family and our friends, what we can do to live in a way that is more beneficial to the earth, our communities and ourselves. And so it's about starting small. I mean, you know, it might mean, um, you know, simply riding a bike more and driving the car less. It might mean eating more, uh, 
you know, more, more fruits and vegetables and less meat. Um, it might mean, you know, next time you do a, a, re, a, you know, a little construction project at your house that is a large house, trying to do that with repurposed materials. So it's about starting where we are and, uh, and not looking at, you know, so ex- like I can't do what he's doing. Instead, the question should be, what can I do? That's a really great point in that, and I think you do a good job of pointing out how what you're doing is applicable to other people. And I feel like that's a great segue into talking about your current project, um, which is food freedom. I guess, is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. All right. Tell, tell us about it. Yeah. So for one year, 365 days, I am growing and foraging 100% of my food. So that means no grocery stores, no restaurants, no uh, gifts of food from other people, no farmer's markets, no, uh, you know, no going to a party and having food, no going to a bar and having a drink. Uh, for one year, everything that I consume, I will grow and forage myself down to the salt that I'm harvesting from the ocean, making my own coconut oil. Uh, growing food right here in the city, going out into the countryside, uh, going to the the woods and and foraging, going fishing. Um, so for one year, everything that I eat, I will, you know, directly with my hands be, you know, connecting with the earth. What inspired the the project, and and how's it going so far? Well, what inspired the project is our globalized, industrialized food system that is. Uh, you know, the center of many of our greatest problems that we face today. Um, We live in this system where our basic food, the thing that brings us life, is destroying life all over the world, whether it's people, animals, uh, the ecosystems as a whole that uh, sustain us and all the other species. And so, but, you know, that sounds glum. But I don't focus on the problems. I like to. I like people to know the reality of our existence, but focus on what can we do. Empower people. And so for me, this is growing and foraging 100% of my food for years. It is. It's an extreme endeavor that's designed to immerse people through my journey in food and inspire them to to do something. That could mean uh, growing. A little bit of food. Maybe they've never grown food before, so maybe it means growing their first tomato and basil plant, um, or maybe going to the local farmers market and not going to the big box stores. Meeting the local farmers, uh, going out in nature and, and learning what grows wildly around us, um, uh, going you know into our yards and learning that there's actually medicinal plants that grow everywhere. So you know that's what it's really about. It's about connecting people with our food and helping people to free themselves from this industrialized, globalized food system. And then at the same time, for me, it's just a wonderful experiment of, is it possible? Now, of course, I know that it's possible because human beings did it for uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and maybe, you know, maybe millions of years. Um, and how long have humans been around? Is millions of years right? Um. You know, I was an anthropology minor, so I should really know the answer to this question. I think it's, I want to say modern humans, 500,000 years. Okay, cool. Yeah, I I realized I should correct myself. Let's just say for sure hundreds of thousands of years. And um, so, but in a Western society, I actually have not met anyone who has done this for a year, grown or foraged 100% of their food. So for me, it's just an extreme challenge. And also just a way to immerse myself in food and learn about it myself and more deeply understand it. Um, And then how's it going so far? Well, today is day 16. So I just finished up two weeks. And I got to say, it's going good. I feel feel real good. My my digestion is actually the best that it's ever been. My body feels great. I feel very mentally clear, Um, you know, removing all the junk from my life. Uh, cause you know, I was, I've always been a, I've been a healthy eater for a while, but you know, it's hard to resist a lot of the cookies and processed food sometimes. And, uh, so, so far it's, it's been going great. I, uh, I've been enjoying it and, uh, I've had a, an abundance of different foods to eat. 
Right. And I, I think that doing it in Florida makes it possible to do it for a year. I, I mean, I, I don't think it would be completely impossible in Vermont, but I guess you would have to have cultivated a lot of food over the summer and then, you know, store it in like a cellar of some kind to, to overwinter. Yeah, I would say doing it in Florida definitely makes it easier because I can grow greens year round here. Um, our biggest challenge is the summer is so hot and humid that a lot of stuff doesn't grow very well oh. um, during the summer. So that's actually the least abundant time here in certain ways. But when you learn about perennial crops, uh, then there's still a good amount of greens all through the summer. But it's so hard because, you know, here the weeds grow so fast that it's so much work in the summer to to just maintain that what a lot of people do is they just take the whole summer off. Um, and a lot of people just leave and go up to Vermont and Wisconsin and, and Ohio and Iowa and just get out of here for the summer. So so Florida has its its share of challenges. The other thing is this, the, the soil here is basically sand. It's, basi- it's almost straight sand in most places. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of challenges here, but I, I think it is a more comfortable place to do it. With that being said, you can certainly do this in the northern climates. Of course, human beings did it for a long time, and uh, there's huge abundances there. I mean, like I was in northern Wisconsin this summer, and I found 30 apple trees or 20 apple trees in, in a two-hour walk and plum trees everywhere. And, you know, there's wild rice growing abundantly up there, and uh, there's just an incredible amount of abundance in food up there as well. So it really comes down to up there, you just have to prepare more. You just have to prepare much more for the winter. Um, but also it's e- easier to preserve foods up there because of the cold, where stuff spoils faster down here and there's more pest problems. So everywhere has its pros and its cons. And uh, I am tempted at some point to do this in the northern nor- northern climate if I'm successful down here. That's really cool. And it it seems like you are kind of saving the summer for the end of your year. Hope so maybe by then you'll you'll really have everything down. Like what are, what is your what are your plans? Do you what do you have in place for for making it through that hot Florida summer? I don't know yet. I've actually been pondering that a little bit for the last few days, but it's not top priority pondering. I there's nothing I need to be doing right now that will more prepare me for it. So I'm not unprepared, but I'm not, I'm not fully knowledgeable on what I'm going to do. The, the main thing really though is calorie crops. Um, so I grow sweet potato, cassava, and then I uh, do um, wild yam foraging. And the thing is all of that is abundant now through like May. So the simple solution is that I'll have to preserve a lot of that, which will probably be drying and freezing um, and maybe canning, but you don't usually can starches. I haven't looked into that too much yet. So yeah. um, But then that's, you know, summertime is also mango season and coconuts. uh, And so there'll be, there'll be an abundance of food and I will definitely figure it out. I'll figure some, you know, a lot of this, I'm figuring it out as I go. There was something that you said in in the video about your tiny house that really resonated with me when you were talking about the number of hours that it took and you kind of you kind of did the math you're like this would have taken me 3 months but instead I had like a group of friends and my community come and help me and it only took you know 3 weeks or is that how long did it take with the group of friends Well it was 2 weekends so two week- really two it was, weekends you know, it was 5 days uh, cause it was a Friday through Sunday and then a, and then a Saturday and Sunday. So really like it was five days, but also that included a lot of other things as well, like building some outdoor stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, we really had the, the vast majority of the structure done, I think in three, in three or four days. Yeah. And I, I just loved how you said, you know, a group of friends could build each other houses you know, over the course of a year of weekends, you know, everybody could have a house if everybody just helped each other out in building them. Yeah. And if, if you keep it simple, like, um, you know, I know some tiny houses are 
you know, mine is the mine is the ex, the other end of the spectrum of tiny houses. Whereas, you know, some people have. I've been to tiny house festivals. I've seen one hundred fifty thousand dollar tiny houses, tiny houses, and I got to say they were incredible and amazing. But uh, this is the other end of the spectrum. This is a fifteen hundred dollar tiny house, so that's a hundred times less. And with that, that means it's it's a little less convenient. It's less modern. It's um, but it is, it's exactly what I want. So, but I do believe, yeah, friends could get together and do a house rotation of tiny house building with, with simple houses, you know, so I'd have to work for the right people that want them to be pretty simple. Um, but it's truly amazing what community can do. And the thing is, it's not just a bunch of altruism. It's not just a bunch of people saying, I want to help this person. It's that, you know, people came out because they wanted to learn that they, they, like, it's like partly living vicariously through someone who's living in a tiny house. Like a lot of people want to live in a tiny house, but they're not going to do it. But to get to be a part of the experience, they get to learn, uh, they get to, you know, there's a level of excitement about it. Um, and then uh, it's also a social thing. You know, it's not like we were just building. It's, you know, getting together with like-minded people, a lot of people that came they didn't know each other, so they got to meet new friends um, that are in this, you know, that are like-minded and care about things like this. Which, in a city like Orlando, they they can be hard to find sometimes because it's a big, spread-out city and it's not a highly conscious city. So I, you know, I created it as a place for people to come together and and be in community, meet new friends that are like-minded, and uh, work on something together. I was hoping we could get specific with your house, because I know people will ask, you know, well, what does he do for water? What does he do for electricity? So could, could we run through those systems? I know you mentioned rainwater harvesting. Maybe we could start there. Sure. Yeah. So my house has no plumbing and no electricity built into it. So it's very simple structure in that regard. So for water, I harvest all of all of my drinking water, my, my showering water, uh, dishwashing is all rainwater. Um, I do use the the hose on site some for sure, but all of my systems are designed around rainwater. Um, and so I I have 600 gallons of storage. 100 of that is on my tiny house, and 500 is on the on Lisa's house because it has a much larger roof. And so the kitchen is an outdoor kitchen, and um, I. I'm not quite done with it yet, but I'm currently working on a gravity system where I have a barrel, 55 gallon barrel that's above the sink and then a spigot. So it'll come out right into the sink and it's totally just from the pressure of the water. Um, and then all of my water, uh, which called gray water, the water that's used to wash hands, dishes, etc., that, uh, currently goes into a five gallon bucket underneath the sink. And then I use that to water the different plants around the property. But what I'm doing is I'm making it a little more streamlined and just having a, a pipe that will just go straight to the banana plants. And so all of my gray water will grow bananas and I'll probably put taro and ginger around that as well. Um, I have a compost toilet. So uh, the compost toilet is a pretty closed loop system. The poop it will be composted for a year and then it's used for fertilizing fruit trees so not direct contact with things like kale although you can do that but fruit trees are just the simplest way to go and the pea uh, is used to fertilize uh, food as well so it has it's high in nitrogen one of the most important nutrients for plant growth and um, then for electricity i was going to do solar but um I don't use that much electricity and I really looked at the, the figures and the environmental impact of the solar panels. I'm using less than $10 worth of electricity per month. Um, so what really made sense was just to run an extension cord for the time that I'm here. And so I just have an extension cord running out that has three plugs. Um, that Having three plugs means I can only use three electronic items at a time, which usually there's not three in there. Um, which just means I use very little electricity, which it's about moderation. I'd love to be off the grid, but this this time around off the grid wasn't quite in alignment because of my year of growing and foraging 100% of my food. I have a, a deep chest freezer for to be able to easily preserve food. So that's why that's the main thing, the main reason why I decided to be hooked up to the electricity rather than solar. Solar could be done, 
but um, I also have a very shady backyard, which is great because it keeps the house cool. Um, so that's electricity and water and the toilet. Is the toilet um, just a, like sawdust style composting? Toilet, yeah. Like a five gallon bucket system? Yeah. So it's just a simple five gallon bucket. And every time that I go number two, uh, I put a handful or two, a scoop or two of sawdust over the poop. And the poop and pee go into two separate uh, buckets. And that that actually is a great system because the poop has to be composted for a year. But pee can be used, you know, immediately. So why combine them and then have to, you know, deal with the pee over a long period of time when that can be used immediately? Um, and also dry matter tends to smell less than wet matter. And so the key with a compost toilet is to, to have the poop basically be dry and have a large amount of carbon. That's what keeps any smells. So my compost toilet really has no smell um, uh, except for the times that I empty it, you know, that I dump it into the system. There's a smell for that short period of time. And that's once a week. And then that smell fades after five, 10 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, that's basically how the compost toilet system works. Cool. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be familiar to a lot of tiny house people. There's a really popular book that I'll plug called the human or handbook. That is the Bible for composting human waste. And, uh, it's just an, it's an entertaining read and also very informative. Yeah, definitely a great book. I actually got to meet him last summer on my bike tour and Oh, awesome. He, he's called the Duke of Duty or the Pope of Poop. <laughs> Joseph Jenkins. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So one thing that I like to ask all of my guests is what are two or three books or movies, just, you know, two or three things that have informed your worldview and have inspired you to, to do what you do? Oh man, do I recommend the writings of Mark Boyle, the moneyless man. Um, a lot of people probably have heard of him. He's been viral on the internet a handful of times. And he lived without money for three and a half years in England. Um, and his books are so amazing. Like there's just this, ama like unlike anything else I've read with, that just really exposes you to the a different perspective of the world and goes so much deeper into these issues. So The Moneyless Man, The Moneyless Manifesto are his first two books. And his third book is called Drinking Molotov Cocktails with Gandhi. And it's about, you know, what actually is violence? Our globalized lives have outsourced our actions and we don't see how our actions affect the world. And this goes deeper into that. So we actually understand, you know, the, 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 the delusion that is our lives to a large extent. So highly recommend those books. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the documentaries that woke me up, uh, Food Inc. was an early one. Earthlings was another early one that really woke me up. And I do have a resource list for documentaries. It's at robgreenfield.tv slash films. And for books, it's at robgreenfield.tv slash books. And there I actually list out uh, the films and books that have had an impact on me and that I recommend. That's awesome. And I'll, I'll definitely link to those from the show notes page. And um, I want to just recommend to anyone listening to follow along, um, follow Rob on Instagram, subscribe to his YouTube channel. I've just been loving following your your journey since you started the the Food Freedom Project and just seeing just the look of sheer joy on your face when you harvest, you know, a giant tuber out of the ground. Oh man, harvesting a potato or a, a yam. Out of, there's something magical about pulling up a carrot or a beet, like something. It's like this, ah, it's just, it's like this, you don't know what's down there and it's this surprise and then this beautiful root of sustenance comes out of the ground. It's, it's a, it's a really amazing feeling. Yeah. And there was one that you harvested that was huge. I think it was a yam. Yeah, that's the wild yam. Dioscoria alata is the genus and species. And it is, uh, they can grow up to 160 pounds for one yam. And the biggest one that I've harvested is 25 pounds. So that's a big source of sustenance for me. That's so cool. Well, 
Rob, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. This was really fun. Well, it's been uh, great to be on with you, Ethan, and glad you're spreading all the spreading all the the knowledge about tiny house living. You can find the notes and links from today's show, including links to Rob's recommended films and books, over at thetinyhouse.net slash 038. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 038. Thank you so much to Rob Greenfield for being a guest on the show. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about Tiny House Engage, my online tiny house community that I mentioned in the opening of the show. In addition to being able to ask me questions anytime and get support and encouragement from fellow tiny housers and access the video training library, there's another benefit that I didn't tell you about. And that is that you get to listen to these podcast interviews live as we record them. And what's really cool about that is that if you have questions for our guests, this enables you to ask them. And so you can not only learn from me and the people in Tiny House Engage, but you can also learn from the guests on the Tiny House Lifestyle podcast. So if you'd like to learn more about Tiny House Engage and register for access, the website to visit is thetinyhouse.net slash T-H-E. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash T-H-E. I can't wait to meet you inside Tiny House Engage. Well, that's all for today's episode. I'm Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.